Our next presenter is Alexander Susin from the USA. He's founder of the Love Method, and his presentation will be about understanding marriage and relationships in the global era. Please, Alexander, go ahead. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear Excellent. you. Excellent, wonderful. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for such an amazing platform where such bright minds and really the, the best of the best, the top of the top can come together and discuss the most important topics that, um, that uh, are influencing us as people on a collective level. And um, the reason I wanted to speak and, and the topic of relationship is so near and dear to me is because I believe that uh, marriage and relationship is, is the fundamental core of any healthy society. And so if we can see from the prism of relationships and marriage, uh, some of the challenges that come out from that, I believe that we can also solve many of the challenges that plague us on a, uh, on a collective level. Now, just to share some of the disturbing um, data out there, right? We know that marriage is seeing some challenges, but to what degree? Where 42% of first marriages fail, um, which doesn't sound so bad, right? We, we used to hear the 50% the target. It was like 42, it's, you know, in comparison, it's not that bad. Um, Hi. What's the time? Maybe we can mute, Josiah. Excellent, thank you. Um, but if we look at the divorce, the second divorce rate uh, for people who remarry for the second time, 60%, and then those who remarry for the third time, 73%, that just lets us know that the problem is not in the institution of marriage, but the challenge is in, in, in us, right? Something happens in that, uh, in that union that, that just, drives people away instead of the promised happily ever after. You know, when we were all growing up, we were raised on stories of uh, the knight conquering the princess and the princess and the knight and reuniting and getting married and, and living happily ever after. And the writers were smart. They tricked us, right? They never told us what, what happens after that happily ever after. So we were sold. And then we get married and uh, we see that... Uh, the promise is not there. Um, we see challenges that we weren't ready to, to, to handle before. And very few solutions for us out there. Of course, there's different, uh, different tricks and different uh, things to, to focus on in the relationships that do work. But on a collective level, we see that it's only getting worse. So the question is why? Why is there such an issue when it comes to a relationship? And we see that it's plaguing not just marriage, right? We see that people who are willing to even consider the, the idea of marriage is just dwindling because it's a lot easier in today's society to get your fix and move on to the next. You know, it's like everything in our life. You know, my cell phone broke, get a new one. Something doesn't fit, I just get something else. Um, and so it's a lot easy to replace people as well, rather than try to focus on, on, on actually building something amazing, like a relationship. Um, and here, there's a very interesting story about a, about a story, uh, actually a, an experiment about, a psychological experiment that I'm gonna get to next, but the story of a newborn. Imagine this little creature, is born into the world. Sure, nature gave him certain predispositions, certain uh, qualities, to certain innate abilities uh, that he's going to predispose to excel in. But then he relies on his environment directly to, to teach him how to interact with the reality that is in. He has no idea where he's at. He's born and he relies on his mother and father, in best of cases, to show him how to interact, how to build relationship, what's good and what's bad. Um, 
And those interactions build in us the, um, the blueprint of how do we relate to the world? What brings us pleasure? What brings us pain? The ultimate uh, gamma of those feelings and the intricacy of each of our blueprint indicates and, and directs our actions and our ability to relate to others. Those whose blueprint is similar to mine, I feel very close to. I can interact on a very open level. Those who are different, I feel a challenge and I feel closeness to, and sometimes friction or hatred even. And when we see, when we implement it with people as well, we see that um, before marriage, there's something interesting happens where we're not willing to open up and reveal our true blueprint. Uh, we feel close association to it and, and guard, guardianship of it. After we get married, we can open up and we can start seeing the blueprint of the other person as it is and some of the things that I don't like about it and vice versa. And instead of relating to a blueprint as something external or something that is not associated to us, we're conditioned to see this as our worldview as something that belongs to us, as our self-identity. What happens when we see it as our self-identity, we essentially are guarding it like ourselves. We interact with others from this blueprint. We're essentially locked in our entire perception of reality is from this blueprint of pleasure and pain, and it's very intricacies, right? I mean, it can go anywhere from food to opening up can be painful, or being in a relationship can be a pleasure, or being in a relationship can be a pain, and then I'm just going to self-sabotage to make sure that my blueprint is correct, because I can't cross myself because I identify with it. Now, there's a, a psychological experience that was, uh, experiment that was conducted um, in the 1920s by uh, Watson and Rayner. Uh, they call it the Young Albert Experiment. It was actually uh, siphoned from a, uh, another experiment that was done on animals to test conditioning. So what they did with this young Albert is they wanted to test how young Albert reacts to certain stimuli. So they took this little boy and they showed him a white rat. The boy had no fear of the white rat. He just, he was curious, but he had no fear of the white rat. Then they introduced a loud banging sound separately from the rat. And the boy was afraid, so he started to cry. Then, to test their hypothesis, the researchers introduced both the white rat and the loud noise, associating the white rat with the fear. What happens after is that once the white rat was introduced into the little boy's sight without the loud noise, it also aroused feelings of fear. So because our subcon subconscious is so unexplored, we see that Underneath the surface, there is a wide network of this blueprint that determines our relation, essentially, to everything around us and how we interact with it, whether I need to be cautious, reject it, uh, like it, love it, care for it, uh, invest myself in it, uh, let it go, throw it away. All of our decisions are essentially made from the perception of this blueprint. Now, the reason it's a challenge is because if we associate ourselves with this blueprint and then we have to live with somebody else, our blueprint, blueprints eventually are going to clash. And what we see is when we don't know how to handle these tough situations in our life, um, arguments, friction, even hatred sometimes, it leads to eventually people saying that, listen, I'm better off by myself than with that other person because he's different than me and I can't get along with him. And why should I live that life? 
rather than try to build some. And so we see that uh, in today's world, those who are really successful are the people who can build those bridges, are people who can get along with other people, are people who um, are more successful at, at building relationships. I wanna leave some time for questions, so please think of them as we go. So what's left for us to do is to find a way, a certain approach that will help us not necessarily focus on changing our blueprint, because even that change will come from a certain place of limitation, but to create an environment that I can no longer associate with my limiting beliefs and limiting relations to life. And through the force of that environment, just like a mother's womb, just like a mother's embrace, when, when we feel that care and love from people around us, we naturally want to grow. We naturally want to um, express ourselves. We are more confident in, in revealing our weaknesses. We're more confident in, in changing and growing. And rather, if I have a hostile environment, then I have to protect myself. If I have a judgmental environment, then I have to block myself from others. I have to make sure that I don't get hurt. It's, it's a primal defense mechanism. And the science of what I believe everybody here is speaking about is how do we formulate such an environment that will create such positive forces of acceptance and care and appreciation and essentially growth like in an ideal family that any person can would be willing to let go of that limiting blueprint that he received from years and decades of upbringing and be willing to change, to grow, to learn how to work with others, to find his place in society, to become fulfilled because now you're not just guarding yourself from others, you're a part of something that's so much bigger than you. And that feeling of being a part of something that's bigger than you, you are swimming in, in a sense of infinite joy and pleasure because you have, you're, you're connected to something great. That's why religions have been so successful. That's why different sects and cults and uh, sports groups and soccer, I mean, <laughs> sports have been so successful because they give a person a sense of belonging place where he can realize himself one way or another. If we can do it on a social and cultural level, and I believe it can start with a small unit like a family, then I believe that uh, we're just going to have a much better and, and happier world. So now I want to take some questions uh, because I know the general, any, any, any questions, not necessarily in what I spoke about, but any questions about relationships, marriage, um, anything that may be heavy on your heart, feel free to ask. Uh, and as much time as we have, we'll, we'll take it from there. We have a question, can you clarify or develop about what type of environment are you referring to? Good question. So an environment is people who are surrounding me, right? When I'm an infant, my environment are my parents, the, the direct caretakers for me. As I grow up, it becomes more social. I have friends, I have teachers, I have uh, my cartoons, as I grow up, the, the sphere of influence grows, right? It, it expands essentially, but there's always a sphere of influence. Who are the people who I feel most close to, most connected to, that are influencing my decisions, my opinions, who I am, how do I interact with the world? So this is my direct environment. 
Meaning, how do we enter into or build such an environment for ourselves that will reflect all the positive that we want to see, all the support that we want to have, and place, a society, a group, whatever you want to call it, that through which we can actually explore these new uh, rules of engagement, these new relationship rules that we're talking about. Does that answer the question, Simon? Mainly, this environment is about uh, the family environment, so the family cluster, if you want to talk about <laughs> comparison, uh, it's a bit unfortunate. <laughs> is it, Alex? You, you are referring sure. about so, this disease, huh? um, Yes, um, specifically when it comes to a family, no family is uh, as an island. Right, we all have friends, we all interact with other people. Um, so a family also needs a supporting environment, meaning a place where a man can connect with other men, where a woman can connect with other women, a place that can uh, we can work through certain challenges in the family, a place that we can um, clarify where we are, a place that will support us, not, not for basically a place that has a united goal for our family to reach closer connection, for our family to reach higher levels of enjoyment. That is my direct environment. And it can consist of other couples, right? Who are similar to me, who, who share the same uh, life situation as me, who may have kids, right? Because I have kids. So whatever the age difference is, I, I know I, I have somebody to come to and ask for support and uh, interact with, mm, uh, but, the rules of engagement, the rules of interaction need to be guided, right? Because they're not natural. You naturally don't know how to, how to work with conflict. So that group has to have a guide. So for example, what I do is uh, in my groups, um, I'm the guide and we work through certain situations. We workshop them, we open them up, we expand them. We look at them through, through different aspects. And then a person gets a different association to um, to an event, he, he no longer reacts emotionally or through his old blueprint, but through interacting in a workshop, he listens to other people's association to that and actually comes out with a much better decision making. So this is the environment that we put together for is specifically in the prism of a family. Anything Thank else? Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time for questions. Uh, I want to thank you. That was a very fascinating presentation.